Greetings and welcome. I'm Daniel Moraz from the Department of Theatre of the University of Ottawa. This paper is entitled Martiality and Transformation, Tao Lu as a Martial Yoga of Space. Tao Lu, the choreographed sequences of the Chinese martial arts, can be described and experienced as a yoga of space. Tao Lu are acts of self-consecration that express martial theatricality and religiosity. Their structure and phenomenology cultivate a particular spatial perception that has combative, theatrical, and religious consequences. D.S. Farrer has proposed we examine cultural practices to trace the threads of martiality found within them. What is martiality? Pragmatically, it is a proto-combative behavior, a level of practical coordination that can approach virtuosity and that can be put at the service of combat. It exists prior to the context that will eventually give it meaning as warfare, hunting, dueling, self-consecration, meditation, sporting competition, aesthetic performance, or a host of other possibilities. Martiality is the performance of combat, which includes, but also transcends, performance in combat. Martiality expressed in Taolu is found not only in Chinese martial arts, but also in Chinese theaters and religious practices, both current and historical. Let's observe the movement routines that make up the fundamental grammar of these ritual, martial, and theatrical activities. In the video on the left, two recreational martial artists who are students of the present-day international Choi Le Foot Kun lineage perform a choreographed fight using double sabers and spear. Simultaneously on the right are two professional teachers of Jingju, or Peking Opera, from the National Academy of Chinese Theatre Arts in Beijing, demonstrating basic phrases of fight choreography with exactly the same weapons. There's a slight difference in the tempo rhythms between these two choreographies. One is a real performance by amateurs, and the other is instructional material presented by professionals. The Jingju weapons are made of light, resilient wood reinforced with twine and fiberglass. The Choli foot weapons, while still light and maneuverable, are made of heavier wood and metal, and the spear is about a third longer. These two presentations are virtually interchangeable. The contexts may be different, but the physical culture and martial movement displayed are the same. Historically, the Chole Foot exponents playing Taolu enacted a magical, religious role for their community. The play of Taolu in a seasonal calendar of popular rituals demonstrated the adept's martial prowess while earning spiritual merit for the entire community. By practicing and demonstrating the arduous and humbling physical training Chole Foot requires, these performers consecrated and re-consecrated themselves over and over to what Daniel Amos refers to as a religion of the body. This self-consecration made them spiritually inviolable and venerable in the eyes of their community. Their demonstration of skill, acquired through perseverance, or gong fu, was a meritorious act performed on behalf of the collective. This self-consecration was also tacitly expressed in theater, Theatre permeated public and private life in 19th century China. While actors belonged to a marginalized underclass, people loved the entertainment they provided and hired them not just to perform, but also to teach and coach. For professional, amateur, and private groups, the learning, rehearsing, and presentation of theatre was beloved, constant, and intense. While non-actors would never perform professionally, virtually everyone was involved in performing at some level. Chinese theatre or Sichu, and the martial arts employ many virtually identical training methods. As Joe Riley relates, In 1991, I filmed a wushu club training in the village temple in Zhongsuo village in Guizhou, 
under their master, Lu Hua Mei, who was also the head of the village theater company. Lu teaches Tang Chen, which is in the middle level range of skills, and over 300 villagers train regularly with him, nowadays girls included. Six small boys also take part in the training, the youngest of whom is 10 years old, and the skills they learn from Lu are also observed from standing on the stage with the village theater company when they perform. As in many villages, the village temple, martial arts training, and performance indivisibly form the cradle of acting in and spectating theater. Whether amateur or professional, actors portraying deities and ancestors on stage would achieve an exponential level of self-consecration. The actors performed martial movement. In doing so, they self-consecrated. Their performances composed the stage figures of ancestors and deities, a further act of self-consecration. These stage figures, in turn, performed martial movement within the fiction of the dramatic narrative, self-consecrating for a third time. More concretely, what makes us move? Tao Lu always imply the presence of another body, even if the practitioner is training or performing alone. The impetus for movement in Chinese martial arts comes from outside the exponent's body. They may begin the process of movement because of an imagined natural force, an ancestor, deity, teacher, or opponent. They may even have a real teacher or an actual audience to salute. But from there on in, they are moving in response to the prompts and demands of an attacker, present or implied. This extroversion is fundamental to all of the developmental agendas we might attribute to Chinese martial movement. To respond competently to violence, I must reject my instinctual or preferred reactions in favor of responses that help me neutralize my aggressor using my environment. To perform capably in a martial competition or demonstration, I must externalize my decision-making process to respond to my partner's actions and timing. To self-consecrate through training, I must abandon my self-involvement and conform my body to pre-existing ritualized shapes and sequences. This rejection of habit and preference is accomplished using a durational training that over time changes my relationship to what I normally consider to be my body. The externalization created through this training process is practical. When called upon to respond to an outside stimulus such as dodging a ball, I will move faster than if I'm asked to merely move as quickly as I can without having to dodge the ball. In the absence of an actual ball, the solo movement training process of the Chinese martial arts teaches me how to construct movement tasks for myself that allow me to use my imagination to access the abilities normally recruited by real stimulus. I achieve this by learning to project my imagination outwards into the space around my body. Both the Chinese martial and theatrical arts describe externalization using the five character formula Shu Yan Shun Fa Bu, the method of integrating the hand, the eye, the steps, and the body. In the theatrical version, the character for body is replaced with Zhi, the character for finger. In some martial arts formulations, the character for Lusun or Sung is added. The formula stands for elements that need to be differentiated and individually emptied of habitual reactions then reintegrated to produce an expert level of performance. A practical example. We eat with our hands. As we prepare to take a bite, we lean forward and drop our heads while we move our hands towards our face. As a result, when we begin to learn martial movement, any action of our arms unconsciously pulls our heads forward, sabotaging our balance and disturbing our peripheral vision. In swordplay, this tendency allows our training partners to tap us on our fencing masks every time we move our sword, as our heads come forward automatically, presenting themselves as easy targets. Consciously separating the actions of the head from those of the hands is essential in learning martial movement. Mid-20th century martial practitioner Tang Ru Kun describes how mastering five characters actually feels. Tang was a teacher of the 20th century martial art named Yi Quan, founded by Wang Xiangzhai. Tang writes that martial training, 
produces qi gan, or the sensations of the life force, which are heat, weight, vibration, and expansiveness. Qi is a term with many meanings, and its use in the discussion of Chinese martial arts is contested. It's been described by Chinese experts as everything from the sina qua non to nothing but bogus talk. For our purposes, qi is a phenomenological correlate to the circulation of blood. My blood is a material substance with an obvious location and flows along predictable paths. When I practice the basic exercises of Chinese martial arts that realign and strengthen the tonic supportive muscles of the body, both my circulation and the depth of my felt sense of heat, weight, and vibration will improve dramatically. To use Tang's terms, my body empties of compulsion and it can fill with qi. The last term on Tang's list is expansiveness, a euphoric, subjective feeling of blending into the environment. As our experience deepens, rather than being hypnotized by ever smaller physical sensations, we reverse our inward focus and project ourselves out into the space that surrounds us. This reversal should tacitly emerge from training and then be supported directly with visualization. Like the externalizations mentioned above, expansiveness is practical. Our ability to orient ourselves has been developed through the practice of stances, postures, and stepping. We can predict the shape of our space and our position in it using our felt sense of the position of our feet, the distribution of our mass, and the orientation of our body. We've also learned to measure the space around us using the body of another through partner training and collaborative martial games. Using the body of another to measure space is called kinetic projection, and we do it every time we write with a pen and feel the surface of the paper through the stylus we are holding. In expansiveness, we combine the potential of all these capabilities to create an imaginal rendering of the space we're moving in. We experience our bodies inside our mind, which is co-equal with space. How much space can we embrace with our minds? I was introduced to three magnitudes of space in my training in the sword play of the Wu Dang Tao Jiao Xuan Wu Pai. The first distance was the range at which I can, with a leap, strike my opponent with my sword, but where they hopefully cannot reach me. The second distance allows me to touch my opponent with one hand while also striking them with my sword, while at the third distance I can strike them with both my elbow and my sword. These three concentric spaces are named after features and phases of Chinese cosmology. The first range is named after the Bagua. The second is referred to as the range of Taiji, or Yin-Yang, and the third is called Wuji. These cosmological designations are surprisingly concrete. At the Bagua range, there are many possible striking actions available. At the Yin-Yang Taiji range, these possibilities have been curtailed to a few binary options, and at the Wuji range, I cannot differentiate clear striking lines as my limbs are entangled with those of my opponent. Visualization is used in solo and then in partner practice to map the space of play. As part of my training in Wudang sword play, I memorized the eight position mandala of the Bagua and practiced projecting it outward in front of me to form a circle around my training partner. I also learned to project it downwards towards the ground to form a circle around myself comprised of the eight principal directions of movement. Lastly, I was asked to visualize the circle in mirror image to be able to see how my training partner was seeing me. These projections were preceded by a series of meditations done holding the jen or straight sword in lying, seated, and standing positions. In these shen jen or body and sword meditations, the student practices merging the felt sense of different parts of their body with the felt sense of the sword they hold. Initially, the student imagines breathing into their lower abdomen and breathing out along the blade of the sword, which is imagined to extend infinitely. Gradually, increasingly complex feelings and intentions are asked of the student. During training retreats, for example, the students are expected to sleep beside their swords 
holding a particular body shape corresponding to the handle, the guard, and the blade of the gem. Three ranges of Xuan Wu Pai swordplay correlate well with the general categories of spatial perception posited by neuropsychology. Extrapersonal space, corresponding to the Bagua range, is the space that occurs outside of our reach. Peripersonal space, corresponding to the yin yang or tai chi range, occurs within the reach of our limbs. Percutaneous space, corresponding to the wu ji range, occurs at and just above the surface of our skin, where even if there's no contact, we will sense heat and motion. A contemporary, if reductive, interpretation of Tang's evocative term expansiveness casts it as the ability to transfer the immediate sensitivity we have at close tactile and visual range to spaces further and further from ourselves. When we begin to learn martial movement, we're extroverted. We hope to be able to defend ourselves from others, to defend martial skill in competition and performance, and perhaps in so doing, self-consecrate in ways our community will find meritorious. Once initiated into practice, we experience a first reversal. We are asked to differentiate our bodily movement, to breathe with the abdomen and mind, to focus on the personal and internal world of perception and sensation. When we come to express the results of this withdrawal into our soma, we encounter yet another reversal. The self-sensing that we've refined through inward focus becomes an outward projection of perception and action. Such reversals are fundamental to the Chinese yogic method of jindan, or the cultivation of the golden elixir. The practice of cultivating the golden elixir dates from the 2nd century CE. It's found in Taoist and other branches of Chinese normative religion. It's composed of physical exercises and visualizations, or tsun xiang. It is undertaken with the view that engaging with our mortality can lead us towards agency and meaning, rather than banal social and material careerism. While not literally concerned with the transmutation of metals, Jindan takes its name and its metaphors from alchemy, comparing the reversal of the normal process of human maturation and decay with the transformation of dross into gold. The reversals of Jindan are also expressed in the narratives of folktales and theater through the trope of divine madness. Consider Jan San Feng, the Taoist immortal and Jindan master that folk tradition credits with the invention of the supposedly peaceful and enlightening martial art of Tai Ji Quan. He's portrayed as a filthy contrarian drunkard who likes nothing more than a good brawl. While this perspective resembles the universal literary trope of Bakhtin's carnivalesque, it is important to keep in mind that Jindan is a technical an embodied process, not just a funny story. Its reversals are specific procedures that produce particular psychophysiological effects. In the Wudang Xuan Wu Pai, an oral transmission attributed to Jiang Sanfeng offers advice on adapting training to various climactic conditions. Under the waxing moon, practicing with the sword enhances the qi. Under the waning moon, practicing slow, even, and open hand movement develops force, or li. Windy night, hike and climb uphill to train the endurance of the lungs. On a rainy night, read Taoist texts and contemplate them. At midnight, meditate to become aware of our human qualities, chief among them our mortality and our tendency to deny it. While still quite general, the specification that training should take place at night reverses social norms and personal habits, setting the would-be student of martial arts on the path towards Jindan. The fundamental effect of any of these reversals is surprise. In theater, surprise is used to control the attention of the audience. In fighting, surprise enables victory or the transformation of disadvantage into dominance. In religion, surprise creates insight when we consider the meaning of the two experiences we prefer not to think about, death and, more critically, life. Jindan is a yogic path, 
a series of disciplined and systematic techniques for the training and control of the human mind-body complex, which are also understood as techniques for reshaping human consciousness towards some kind of higher goal. The Tibetan Six Yogas of Naropa is one of the few pre-19th century traditions of yoga known today, and it follows a comparable series of reversals. The practice begins with intense physical training, called trulkor, that includes extensive martial and theatrical movement. The heat, weight, and vibration experienced in trulkor is turned within, using visualization and breath retention to produce heat in the body, called tumo. The resulting expansiveness is used to project the imagination out of the body into a variety of spaces. The adept visualizes and projects multiple bodies for themselves. They project themselves into the liminal space between life and death and subjectively experience the ejection of their consciousness into pure space. What I am calling the yoga of space is the ability to project the imagination into the negative space around the body and to intentionally manipulate that empty space as though it were a positive object. In the context of combative training, theatrical performance, or religious inaction, the martiality of Taolu actualizes this unusual and powerful experience. Thank you very much.